let me just start by sharing my screen here. So we are being joined by Larry Breen from Nearform. And Nearform are the developers of the COVID tracking app in Ireland. And so there'll be very uh, some very interesting insights that we'll have from um, Larry. And before we hear from Larry, we're going to hear from um, Thomas Coleman from Zendra Health. And Zendra Health have also been very active in building apps for healthcare in the healthcare se sector. Okay, before we um, before we start, I'm going to talk a little bit about DConnect, who we are, what we do. So DConnect is a digital health hub based out of Dundalk Institute of Technology. And our main sponsors are um, Enterprise Ireland, but there's also sponsors from a range of different companies in the area and government agencies. And DConnect's mission is to stimulate, foster and enhance uh, digital health for creation of enterprise products and services that address the healthcare needs of society. And to do that, DConnect is building a bridge between businesses, the healthcare sector, universities, and society. And we've been joined in this effort by a dedicated cluster organization in connected health and well-being, which supports startups. And together we also help commercialize research and provide um, connections to businesses and investors for collaborative projects. Our audience are um, companies large and small, so ranging from the startups to the small medium enterprises and large corporations and connecting them with government, universities and investors. And our key strategies have been to build out our digital network, to create a knowledge hub, to provide services for enterprise building, digital transformation, and globalization. And to that end, DConnect provides services um, like business strategy guidance um, and technology guidance. So help with prototyping, wireframing, uh, things like that. And um, this is the team here. Feel free to get in touch with any of us. And uh, without taking too long, I'll hand over now to our first speaker, our first speaker is Thomas Coleman from Zendra Health. Um, okay. So I'll hand over to Thomas now. Yeah, thank you very much, Connor. And uh, thank you, D Connect and the uh, Dundalk Institute of Technology for this opportunity. It's great to be speaking here this morning. I also have the presence of uh, Larry from Nearform. So I'm just going to share my screen. Is that okay? That's wonderful, Thomas. So this is a, a workshop on building health apps and <clears throat> consider this like as if you're, uh, you know, greetings for building a cake and uh, you're, you're, you, you'll be looking at certain, um, we're going through certain aspects for you to consider. So where our team has built highly effective digital health solutions for world own health institutions, such as Stanford University, Apple, and Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And we also build solutions for the likes of the HSC, CUH, and we're also experts in building software as a medical device. So we're ISO 134 certified by the NSCI. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm just gonna give you a little intro here into what we do. So we help healthcare services to digitalize service pathways and accelerate their time to market for software as a medical device through a no-code platform. And what I'm going to do is tell you a story about Linda. Now, Linda could be you. Uh, she's at the start of her journey, she could be in the middle of her journey, and she's looking to build a digital health solution to help her patients. She's a hand surgeon and she'd like to enhance her service pathway for patients undergoing hand surgery um, and get better visibility in between kind of clinic visits. 
Now, Linda has a, a number of things to consider as part of her digital health journey, okay? And this is cost, resources, time, highly specialized skill sets, design, interoperability, governance, and activation point. And consider these as the kind of the ingredients for a cake that you're actually building for your health solution. Some you might be already aware of, and, and others, uh, you know, you, you don't. And I'm hoping over the session, you go, okay, I've learned something new, uh, and this is what we need to look into, okay? Um, so first of all, building digital solutions, it's really expensive, okay? Um, it costs an average 380,000 euro to build a digital solution, as according to a research to guidance, ML developer economic support. Um, and the reason being is that it requires an interdisciplinary team, uh, normally of like, you know, soft engineers, uh, medical domain experts, QA product owners, etc. And also, um, it's a really time consuming process. It can take an average 15 months to roll out a digital solution. And the reason being is that it's uh, a highly regulated industry, okay? And it needs to take into consideration security, uh, medical device regulations, so forth. And these are things that will just go through short. So um, in terms of highly skilled, specialized skill sets, um, you really require technical security and legal expertise, all right? So I know we're all pretty, kind of pretty tired of hearing about GDPR compliance, um, but it's really important that people are on top of that. And also in the US, the equivalent of that, which is HIPAA. So if you're releasing your solution over in the US, just very cognizant of the uh, security uh, regulations there in terms of protecting patient data. And not alone that, but also be cognizant of when you're releasing into respective say, health frameworks, say in the HTC or NHS, there could be other uh, kind of security accreditations that you need to uh, uh, adhere to in order to uh, be onboarded as part of their procurement process. Okay, so that normally involves security penetration tests, proof of that, and, and, attack, uh, and also certificates as well. And another aspect to consider in terms of specialized skill sets is regulatory expertise, all right? Um, and, and particularly as of this year uh, with EU MDR, it's having a major impact on digital health, all right? And it's from May uh, 2021. Um, so if your health digital solution acts as a diagnostic or as interventional, it may need to be uh, classified as a, a medical device, all right? Um, and really what happened before is that before its predecessor was called EU MDD or Medical Device Directive, uh, where basically, you know, you could self-certify and get it C-marked. With EMDR, the barrier for actually whether something to be self-certified has been lowered, and it just basically means that more solutions will likely need to be classified as medical device. So uh, this is probably where probably half the audience, uh, so my apologies, Larry and uh, Connor, but it just to be aware of is these standards, okay? So IEC 62304, which is software as medical device, uh, risk management, ISO 134791, uh, uh, usability engineering, which is IEC 62366, and then ISO 13485, which is requirements for quality management system uh, to prove that it consistently meets the regulatory requirements and customer requirements for producing medical devices. Now, given just our own story, we were always aware of the medical device regulation because uh, given what we do in Zendra Health is we allow uh, to easily digitalize service pathways and accelerate time to market for software and medical device for medtech companies and healthcare services. Um, and two things kind of kept cropping up to us. One was uh, we knew EU MDR was coming. Okay, so there's going to be more of a driving need for, for what we call, we're in the right to answer called a contract manufacturer. So we produce uh, software our medical device software on, be on behalf of our clients, which we were legal manufacturers. So we knew there'd be more of a, more demand for that. And also secondly, there was, we could see that clients were getting, they, they, were, they were initially rolling out their solutions. Uh, they didn't want to be quite interventional and we want to get very comfortable having that conversation. Should it be classified as a medical device that we had the expertise and quality management systems to support them in that journey. Um, and, and, and just to kind of give, give, give just kind of drill into that a bit is that yeah, you, you, you've always, you, you might be at those crossroads already, you might, they might be ahead of you, they might be slightly behind you, but I highly recommend that you just have a look at your solution and see, you know, does it, may need, does it potentially need to be classified as a metal device? Or maybe in the future does it, should it get more conventional? And, and, and examples I give there would be, say, if it's um, maybe you're collecting data for, with the view of two, two to three years time that it gets it's going to be doing machine learning and powered insights and maybe doing some more automated or replacing clinical decision-making. Then it would need to be classified likely as a medical device. So sometimes the strategy is um, 
it's actually much more uh, costly to, uh, you know, retrospectively try and uh, put in medical device regulatory standards in the software that's been developed. And maybe, so trying to align your product roadmap with your regulatory roadmap. And if, if, if something is like to be classified as medical device two to three years time, maybe initially embrace that and, and, and initially classify your soft medical device as a low class medical device uh, with a view that it might uh, in, increase in classification going forward, okay? Because um, we, we, we've encountered just chat with some peers where they had some really horrible experiences where uh, the unfortunate chose the, an incorrect vendor to begin with uh, when they realized that their digital health solution was going to be conventional and need to classify as a medical device and they needed to actually just kind of back out, cancel that project and start again, again. But choosing a supplier that is at least ISO 1345 compliant, but ideally certified. Okay. Um, and another thing to consider is design. All right. So, um, of course, just apply human centered design that's focused on key stakeholders, patients, carers, and the care team. And keep the required input fields to a minimum to minimize barriers of adoption. So, all we about here is that, like, as you get into solution builds, try if you can get involved in from the key stakeholders. Um, if, if you know, get 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 um, feedback from a patient advocacy groups and from the care team. And again, just the, the make, make sure you question every input field that you're actually putting into the application. Is it necessary? Because each input field that you introduce, it's just introducing another excuse for a patient or a care team member to maybe not engage in our solution. Um, the next thing to consider is interoperability. Okay, uh, it's, it's really kind of like important now that your solution as it collects data that it stores them using open healthcare standards, such as say HL7 Fire. Uh, so it's highly interoperable existing healthcare systems and you're kind of like, you, you're very strong with, one can be very strong with the partner play. You can easily integrate with existing healthcare systems such as electronic, electronic health record systems. And also um, be aware of any other health standards that have been introduced into healthcare system. So Sonoma CT is being, it's introduced in the NHS, but also in the HSC, and it's kind of like a standard way of uh, categorizing clinical terms. Okay, so be aware of that of the landscape and, and try and kind of incorporate those elements into your solution, be it now or as part of your roadmap. Um, and then in, uh, in governments is also a, a kind of thing to be aware of. All right, so when you get your solution built, how much responsibility do you want to give the care team on the digital solution? All right. Um, should there be actively or passively monitoring uh, the service users via reports or incoming data? If so, how often? All right. So sometimes you, uh, you can go to kind of care team members or your, your stakeholders and go, yes, uh, get the solution. It's going to solve your pain points. Um, but um, the, the, and you're collecting data, but suddenly they get kind of frightened, going, okay, what do we do with this data? Am I responsible for that? Um, am I supposed to monitor that? So you kind of need to address that and, and, and figure out. Is it just going to be passively collected and it's there for search purposes um, or is it going to be monitored and have that kind of conversation with your key stakeholders on that. A really important point to consider is activation. Point. You might have a great idea for a digital health solution, but where does it get, uh, you know, activated, okay? Uh, and, and what I'd really recommend here is that it's designed to seamlessly integrate into an existing care pathway. All right. Sometimes I hear, hear, hear people that can go, oh, we have a cell solution. It's going to be great. And they go, how are you going to introduce it into the care pathway? It's like, oh, um, we might send an email after they can see their consultant. And the, the more asynchronous the, the introduction of that digital solution is, the, lead, the less likely it's going to succeed, unfortunately. So make sure you try and engage that you, see, you can fit your solution to, to fit in with that care pathway so that people on board it as part of that care pathway, say maybe as a patient that has their first appointment or you know the consultant visit um, or any alternative ways um, because it just kind of helps increase the likelihood that that, that user will uh, you know use the app, download it and, and, and engage with it. And also the more clinician buy-in for your solution, the better. And this particularly happens is kind of pertinent for a pilot. Um, if, if you've got one clinician that thinks your solution is great and wants to roll, that, roll it out into the clinic or the healthcare institution, that's great. But try if you can to get more than one health champion because one never knows what can happen. Maybe that person gets redeployed into a 
at another healthcare institution. So try and kind of de-risk that by getting other champions involved and getting buy-in, all right? Um, and there's one thing actually uh, Connor mentioned, and it's, it's a really important point just before we, we had this discussion, um, is that uh, uh, point nine would be commercialization, all right? Um, so really look at how your uh, solution is, uh, you know, that it fits into the how your stakeholders or your, your prospects are being funded, all right? Um, it's really important. W one time we, we had a really kind of like proposal that went great, and then it was just like you could hear a pin drop once you went through the pricing. And, it, and what we learned, the hard lesson was, is that the pricing wasn't aligned to how they were being funded. So really do your homework in, in terms of your, uh, you know, your target audience. How did it, what's their budget allocation? How are they funded? And, and align your pricing strategy towards that if you can. All right. So hopefully from all these different facets from, you know, costs, resources, security, regulatory, um, activation, governance, um, you have a good idea of like, you know, things, things to consider. All right. There's one or two things I might kind of come back to. Um, but unfortunately, you can go through all those high entry barriers and your solution might still be ineffective. All right. And there's two key reasons here. One is traction. All right. And the reason for potentially poor traction is maybe one is culture. So improved training is a kind of way to actually kind of address that. So maybe I really mean culture is like the, just culturally wasn't a good fit for, 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 for those stakeholders. All right. So one is maybe the training wasn't sufficient. They didn't feel like they were involved. The two kind of goes back to um, champions. So trying to adopt more, like, you know, the more champions you have for your solution, the better. And I'll be honest, these... This one is the kind of key one for so many of these issues. It's, just, it's better engaged with the key stakeholders. So again, really try to ensure that as you're designing your solution um, and creating it, that you're getting feedback from your key stakeholders, be it the care team, patient, carers, whoever they are. And also, this, the, the, the last point here, this is really relevant pre-COVID, uh, where maybe it was just you're a bit too early. Maybe the team was country just not ready at the time. And that's... I, just from our own experiences, that's definitely been kind of relevant to us um, where, you know, years of digital transformations happened months in COVID-19. And, and now healthcare services are aware of it. They've realized they can use technology uh, to enhance their service pathways. Another reason for poor traction could be just simply over ambition. Um, so they could be, could be trying to just do everything all at once. All right. Um, so to try and use a baby step approach to find a solution. So that could be maybe focus on one particular cohort one particular type of treatment um, um, and, and, and take it by kind of like a you know, piecemeal approach, all right? Um, because particularly on for care teams, it actually is quite overbearing how to actually, uh, for them to digitally transform their care pathways. So it's, it's kind of easier for them as well to digest if you kind of break it into little smaller stages for them. And, and, and also uh, just simply again, it ties into better engagement with key stakeholders, okay? So maybe people, some people were just unaware, they thought it was going to uh, solve some other issues and it wasn't to make sure everyone is on the same page in that regard. And lastly, in situ, uh, the uh, due diligence. So perhaps, you know, just one got too excited with the solution, but just didn't do a sufficient uh, a competitor analysis, all right? Maybe there's a solution already out there that's really dominant to the market. Um, and again, it could be just better engaged with key state stakeholders. Um, another reason uh, for poor traction would be uh, poor rollout strategy. Um, so consider maybe allocating a budget for marketing, PR, advertising and training. And also consider a partnership to gain leverage in, in the industry, right? Um, so because so it's, you know, sometimes the partnerships kind of work huge access to the cohorts to look at the targets. So definitely that's something to consider. And um, the, the, the last of the, of, of the reasons for poor tactic potentially is poor and insufficient reviews. So the less reviews in your solution, uh, the less traction. So consider putting in a, a review, review widget in your solution and also incorporate learnings from negative reviews on similar solutions. So, you know, maybe the Google Store, App Store, Google Play Store, have a look at competitors, see what feedback they're getting and incorporate those learnings. And the second part of it as well is, is, is um, poor engagement, all right? Um, so the reason for a poor engagement with the solution could be that it's just badly designed. So uh, maybe it wasn't sufficient kind of like design workshops done initially. So work with a UX expert to solve the solution. 
and again, you know, get key stakeholders on, uh, on board for user testing. And um, it could be poorly instrumented. All right. So just to give you kind of like a story where um, like we were rolling into a solution we involved in many years back was mobile based research study. And uh, the first page uh, had scientific copies written by scientific writers and it caused a 90 percent drop off rate in that mobile research study. And it wasn't instrumented enough at the time. So they, we couldn't swiftly rectify what, what it, where it was the exact issue. So make sure that you know you're putting in all the kind of such great resources into getting the solution out there that it fits and seems to into your pathways and that you're looking to target. But make sure it's also highly instrumented, all right? So that you can get kind of like you can swiftly react to any retention rate drop-offs, hotspots that potentially are there. And also, um, this could be just like it could be just un unsuitable digital intervention method. Okay, so a few things could be here. The app keeps reminding me of my chronic condition. So maybe consider that it should behave non-interventionally. Uh, and also use behavior nudges um, or a potentially blended approach. And maybe it's also just take a step back and go, was well, an app the right uh, medium for this solution? Maybe it could have been web-based. Maybe it was actually something else was uh, more of uh, kind of the unmet needs that should have been uh, looked into instead. Okay, so really look into, especially when you're looking at your primary, the target market you're looking for and, and, and seeing, uh, you know, what percentage of them would use smartphones or tablets and dial in on that, all right? Be very, very honest with yourself. Um, and yeah, that's the crux of, you know, our kind of like key learnings that we've kind of uh, got from building solutions. And uh, one thing I'll just go back on is, say on the red tree part. So if you're on those crossroads where you're kind of wondering whether your solution uh, maybe need to be classified as a metal device or not. What I'd highly recommend is, first of all, you identify what market you're releasing that solution into. So if that's, you know, in Ireland, you deal with the HPRA. If it's in the UK, you'd be dealing with the retro body uh, MHRA. And in the US, it's the FDA. And from there, then you can just do your research and especially the re excellent materials out there where you can kind of figure out, okay, given my solution, uh, this is where the classification I think it would be. But what you'd recommend is, I'd recommend is you engage with a registry consultant to help you on that journey because they're, they're experts in that field. And also then you can engage with the relevant registry body too. Um, and, and with registry consultants, it's kind of, it's like Goldilocks. Um, you know, you, you might, you'll find the right one. So the first one, you might, might meet the right fish. Uh, you might kind of hear doom mongers where it's like, oh, it's, it's a class three device, it's, it's high risk and others might be a bit too lenient, but you'll find the right fit, okay? But just be aware of that, you might need to ask a few. And ourselves, we, we have an excellent experience as well. You know, um, I remember at the time we, we kind of did consult with Dundalk Institute of Technology and they were excellent help to us too. So I really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I hope you found some of the points um, very useful and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was... Um very, very practical and very, very useful advice there. So our next speaker is going to be Larry Breen from um, Nearform. And then we're going to follow up um, Larry's session with question, answer and discussion between Thomas, Larry and the audience. Um, Larry, are you there? I am here. Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome. Uh, thanks for showing up. It seems to be a, a good number of folks turning out today, considering everything that's going on, preparations for Christmas, COVID-19, and obviously this little storm called Barra that's, uh, that's blown around the place. Um, so great to have you all here. Uh, the introduction by Connor, thanks very much. Yeah, we're near Forum. Uh, a lot of people currently know us for the contact tracing and COVID response apps and your digital certificates and all that kind of good stuff in, in response to COVID. Um, we've gained a, a high degree of notoriety and we'll talk about that sort of journey in a minute. Uh, that's actually a very small part of what we as Nearform actually do. Um, so we've, we're, we're, uh, we were founded down in Tremor uh, in County Waterford, down here in the sunny southeast. Um, and we're still headquartered here, but we're now based across 30 countries worldwide uh, with an ever-growing team and expanding quite rapidly. Um, we've been around for 10 years and, and we've worked with a lot of leading brand names. Um, we sit behind the scenes, so we bring that engineering excellence to the table when it comes to application and software uh, design, delivery, 
deployment, DevOps, and, and, and obviously ongoing running. And, and, and we work for the likes of, I don't know, uh, Netflix, Walmart, uh, Vogue, uh, Ancestry.com. You know, the list goes on and on. And some, some, some great super names and stuff to actually throw out there. Um, in the health space, we work with a number of clinical research organizations, uh, health apps, uh, digital health journeys. Obviously, we continue to work with a lot of the health authorities around the globe. Uh, in terms of their future digital health strategy. So we've got quite a wide plethora of, of, of things that are actually going on. And, and obviously an open invitation to anybody on this call at any stage, if, uh, if I can help you in any way, please feel free to reach out. Obviously, uh, we can leverage my network where possible to obviously get you guys in front of the right people uh, around the globe and, and, and help you move forward. So, so that's an open invitation there for you. Let's start with uh, Connor's introduction in terms of, of COVID-19. Um, so if we go back sort of 18 months, you know, sort of March of last year, um, COVID was just really dawning on the horizon. This pandemic had arrived. Uh, what we hoped was going to be sort of a, a small issue suddenly became this big monster that we needed to deal with. Um, from a near form point of view, you know, we were aware of it the same as any other business. Um, we we're obviously supporting our clients and new clients through that particular journey in terms of a lot of people looking at what a pandemic would do for their organizations and how we could actually help them. Um, we had no real sort of uh, intent at that stage of really getting into dealing with COVID directly in, in, in the way we ended up doing. And, and that came about from, actually the Irish government was the first government to reach out to us. And we had multiple governments reach out since. Um, and they came to us with a problem one morning. So it was actually one Saturday morning, rang us up and said, hey, listen guys, COVID's on its way. We're not sure exactly how or what we wanna do to but here's our thoughts and ideas. Let's understand what's possible. And, and we got a few folks, uh, near form and some other companies, um, you know, onto separate calls to, to give them a very high level brief of what it is they actually want us to do. The idea being is give everybody a couple of weeks to go off and, and you know, do a bit of research and come back with proposals and ideas and papers and presentations back to, to the org. The way near form work is we work slightly different. So we basically took that idea um, we spun up a team actually that afternoon um, and 10 days later we handed them their first app. So rather than turn up with pieces of paper and pretty pictures and all that kind of stuff, we gave them something tangible that they could work with. So they could then go out, uh, speak to obviously healthcare providers, get folks like the Gardaí and the Defence Forces and stuff involved to run some trials and tests so we can actually learn and, and, and understand. That obviously secured us that piece of work and, and uh, you know, we were identified as the, the uh, engineering vendor of choice to obviously take that project going forwards. And, and it's really important that we understand from, from the point of view is, you know, Neuroform are seen as, you know, the contact tracing COVID response app folks. Um, we're absolutely at the heart of it, but the whole key to it was collaboration. And Thomas's session touched on it a little bit, and we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more, but, the key to success of that, and that was, you know, a super successful app by pretty much anybody's standards. We had to evolve that app. And again, from that agile point, from the point of where we started that Saturday morning to where we actually got to with the launch finished product, it changed considerably. Even the underlying technologies, uh, getting the likes of Apple and Google to collaborate and, and, and change some of their operating systems to allow us to do things. It really evolved at a very rapid pace. But there's a lot of other pieces that kind of go into it. And this is important from a, an application build and, and the success of that app is uh, absolutely when we're in medical devices and we're, we're looking at health apps, obviously we need to make sure that, you know, robustness of security certifications, we're, we're taking all those particular boxes and, and I won't revisit that. Tom's did a great job sort of touching on those. Um, but we also need to look at things like behavioral studies and activities. How are people actually going to engage? Um, key within health, unlike a lot of other apps, um, is it needs to be very much inclusive. So we need to reach out to that wide population. So we need to make sure that our target audience is fully understood, that we're not just focusing on, you know, tech savvies, narrow demographics, that we're actually making it available to everybody. So everybody has that kind of understanding that's out there. It's important that we bring in accessibility. So uh, all of our engineers are accessibility trained. So again, we have a clear understanding to make sure that we can engage um, that side of the community and make sure that our products are offering the optimum on that side. But again, to make sure that that's happening, we engage with folks like NCBI. Yeah, bring those guys in and, and, and get them to help us along that path and journey. And, and the one big call out I'd put out to everybody here is, 
there are a whole bunch of folks out there that are more than happy to have a coffee, have a quick Zoom call, have a quick chat, um, and give guidance and, and, and some help and their insights. Um, now, again, your choice is to take it and use it or take it and, and you know, stick it in the bottom drawer for a later date or just ignore it altogether. That's absolutely fine and no one's precious about it. But the willingness for people to collaborate and actually work together is, is quite remarkable. Um, and we saw that within that COVID uh, response. So obviously, as you all know, we got to the point, we got the app um, uh, ready to actually go live. We needed to do it in a privacy preserving. So we needed to make sure that we had DPIA so the data protection office needed to sign off and to make sure all data was properly handled and managed. It needed to be privacy preserving. So again, we had a whole bunch of academic as well as commercial institutions actually coming in and doing reviews and, and signing off on it. But we also reached out to the wider community and, and part of the, the core DNA of Nearform is we do work and we do contribute and we're very active members within the wider open source community. So again, we, we reached out to those uh, folks that we've worked with over the years across the globe and got again them involved to really understand, you know, the code that we're using underneath, how's it going to be perceived out in the marketplace, how can we do it better or different, and especially when it came to the whole privacy preserving, that's where people are most nervous um, within the whole contact tracing and, and, and the COVID response apps. But obviously that kind of uh, diligence and, and, and attention to detail is important in all of the healthcare apps. If we're going to put healthcare data or leverage healthcare data or do anything associated with healthcare, we need to make sure people feel very comfortable and costed that it, you know they're not going to be subject to information drifting all over the place, mismanagement or, or loss or, or, or uh, ingress or whatever else. So from that point of view, again, we got all of those folks involved from all different quarters and, and, you know, they also were all available for everybody on this call and everybody that, you know, you're talking to out there, you know, folks that are, are there to kind of happen. Um, from that point of view, um, getting the actual app launched. So obviously we very much focused on setting up the environments and, and the technology and the engineering and getting it ready to go in consultation with all of these advisors across the government and, and, and wider sectors. But what's also super important is the whole communication side of it. So again, when you get to the point of getting those apps out there launched, it's making sure that you've got that solid, consistent, easy to consume message. And, and we see it a lot as obviously we work with a lot of startups and mature companies um, where they build some very clever and great things. But the problem is sometimes they trip over their cleverness. So if I'm working on a project, and I've done it myself in the past, spun up a company, built out a product of, you know, live, dream, slept, worried about it for, you know, two, three years before we actually get to market. And then you get to market and you launch it and people don't really understand what it is you're actually doing because you've become so ingrained in understanding your own product. You take certain things for granted that there's a base knowledge, which there's not. So again, always look at that lowest common denominator, make sure it's nice and easy and straightforward. Um, and, and make sure you're able to get that level of engagement out there. Again, that level of inclusivity. Look out for, you know, in certain circumstances, your silver surfers, you know, the more aged population that may not have the technical skills that some of the youngsters have. Understand those behaviors. And, and that becomes very important. Again, going back to Thomas's point is he was looking at it more from a, a certification and making sure that you, you've, you fall into that kind of category. But when you start out on your journey, understand who your target audience are going to be and therefore what are their capabilities so so heading off and, and creating some cool engineering technical stuff if it doesn't really provide value and is usable for that wider population you need to ask the question of why you actually want to do it so that's kind of important that actually sits out there now in terms of that collaboration again we were um we open sourced the the actual project that we built for the irish government uh we took it and we open sourced it as part of the linux foundation public health so we made it publicly available to anybody in the world there was two reasons for us to do that one was we were looking at the greater good so in conjunction with the irish government the hse we wanted to make uh all the work that we collectively had done and all the learnings we had done make that freely available to anybody that any country any government that wanted to pick it up and actually run with it what's the point in them reinventing the wheel that we've already got a great wheel for you know uh, designed and, and, and ready to go was point one point two was again it was allowing for that level of scrutiny and, and understanding and, and getting those kind of contributions from the technical community again a lot of folks are happy to give time energy and volunteer to actually support it so it's another tool in your arsenal use it 
Um, and it's great. And, and obviously it helps you get different perspectives and understandings that actually have out there. Again, sitting within that, one of the key pieces that um, really sort of came to fore as part of that whole COVID project was about that collaboration and community and working together. So we saw it within the projects, the individual government projects that we worked with. So a lot of cross government and interdepartment, uh, private and public sector, everybody pulling together for, for the good of like Ireland in, in that particular case. But we also saw it branch out across the wider global health network. So we were very fortunate to work with the likes of the WHO, CDC, multiple governments across Europe, uh, Asia, as well as North America. And everybody became very open to that whole uh, collaboration. But we also saw enterprise come into it. So we lot, saw a lot of folks that historically we would associate with very much a protected kind of environment, wouldn't want to talk to everybody and share they became very sharing and engaged in the whole process. And, and that's why we had such success and we continue to have success with, with the work that we've done within that COVID response. That's why we've delivered it across nine, 10 countries. And, and you know, that continues to sort of grow. And there's a whole bunch of other countries using the technology themselves in their own implementations, which we're absolutely delighted for. Um, coming away from COVID, um, I'd like to say we're fully away from it, but as we all know, we're not. So, you know, obviously that journey continues and we continue to support uh, the various governments and, and, and that side of it. But we're now trucking on and we're looking at um, how we actually support the wider healthcare and, and life sciences sector and, and what needs to be done to really drive that forward. And Thomas kind of touched on it in, in, uh, in his session in terms of COVID has changed the landscape. Um, it's changed people's perceptions and ideals. So folks are more open to collaboration, they're more open to working together, they're more open to coming together, sharing information, sharing ideas and, and data. And, and that's even within, you know, the competitive landscape. So the way we would look at it in terms of, you know, I typically look at the market at the moment in, in terms of three layers. So you've got a top layer, which is your protected assets. So that's your intellectual property, your competitive advantage, you guys will all have that very clearly in your mind, looking at your shareholder value and what's your proposition that you need to look after and you need to protect. Um, and that's fine. And that's that's that stuff is, you know, is the gold dust. That's the piece you shareholders. And that's what's going to get you your valuations when you start going out and looking at fundraising and, and all that kind of stuff. Sitting underneath it, you've got two layers or one layer that's split into two. You've got some common components that are unique to your market, but they don't actually give you that competitive advantage. There's no real, you can't really put intellectual property or any of the rest of it around it. And what I would say to folks is have a look at how can you collaborate and share some of that. So use some of those common components that are out there with others. And that kind of segues into then the bottom layer that sits underneath and underpin that there's a whole bunch of activity going on in open source. And we're going to see a whole bunch more come out of open source, both from the public sector. So all of the governments we're engaged with are all keen to uh, commit a lot of uh, activity into open source and, and donate code and, and, and push projects into the open source environment, make it available for everybody freely. But we're also seeing within the sort of life sciences, the pharma, biotech, med device companies, again, is, there's a whole bunch of things out there that just make sense for us to open source and let every build communities around it and let everybody leverage it. Don't lose sight of that as your startup. Um, and and uh, I learned this over the years. Again, I've, I've started up multiple companies and, and, and built multiple companies. You know, you want to build everything yourself. You're precious. It's your baby. You want to nurture it. You want to do everything for it. But you've got finite energy, believe it or not. No matter how enthusiastic you are, you've got finite energy. You're better off focusing that energy on the things that are really going to matter to move your business and your product and your project forward and look at where you can either leverage other people's understanding, learning, market position, other people's code. Um, so again, share and, and get into joint initiatives um, or pull in stuff from the open source community going, hey, there's components out that we can actually leverage and, and use to drive forwards. Don't get too caught up in having to do everything yourself. There's a big wide world out there. And, and what we're seeing as part of that whole COVID is everybody is actually becoming more and more open to the notion of uh, collaboration, working together, sharing, again, as long as we make sure we protect that asset value that sits within, within the supply chain. So, so that's kind of super important. The second piece that kind of comes out of it is, um, it would be right to say that a lot of healthcare, especially within the public sector, but even the wider sector, 
by by the very nature of um, you know caution needs to be had around any kind of health practice or anything. We need to make sure we got it right. Take your time, work your way forwards. But what we've recognised within um, the last sort of two years is within healthcare, we don't have to be as slow as we historically have been. Everything doesn't have to take years and years and decades and decades. There is the ability for us to actually um, do things a lot faster and do it in such a way that we can actually do it to a higher degree of confidence than historically we have done. So it's challenged some of the old ways of thinking. And, you know, if you look at bringing a new therapy to market through the pharmaceutical um, supply chain, you know, it's uh, half a billion dollars, five to 10 years to actually get a new therapy from R&D through to actual out inpatient care, just as a, as, as a rough number. That's been there because of history and how we've worked and, and the caution and, and all the different bits and pieces that we've had to do and going through all the different certificates. Now that we're in a new world is we can look at using the tools that we can use shared data. We can look at learnings and, and using the systems and the softwares that are actually out there to allow us to do things uh, a lot better, a lot faster, and therefore we can reduce the timelines and we can reduce the cost of going to market. So for businesses, it means you can get there faster uh, at a lower cost. Uh, but what it also does, and the piece that excites me the most is we have a huge amount of illnesses and, and, and disease and stuff that are out there that sit on the fringe. That they're just not economically viable. It's a horrible thing to say, but they're just not economically viable. So all we can do is offer those folks suffering from it is palliative care. Let's make them comfortable and look after them, but we can't fix them. We can't do a huge amount other than just, you know, kind of give them a hug and, 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 and help them through their journey. By reducing the cost to serve, by bringing more of these therapies into that economically viable model, by doing it, we start to expand our reach. We're able to bring more people under the healthcare umbrella and actually improve their health and, and change those kind of outcomes. We we'll also understand, you know, again, by bringing some of these cost measures, and, it's, and the reason I'm talking about this to you guys now is you need to understand this is the mindset that's, that's really sort of bubbling up within the whole industry and, and the solutions and your positioning within the market really needs to sort of drive and dovetail into that to resonate with it. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of that kind of activity and, and there's going to be a lot more conversation on that over, over the coming months and, and years. The final piece before I stop is um, a word of caution. I speak to a lot of the pharma companies, biotech, med device companies, multiple public health authorities across the, you know, the, the different continents around the world. There's a growing concern. So everybody has an, has an app or is thinking of an app or is in the process of, of delivering an app, which is great. What we have to be very careful of is understand is how are they synergistic? So how do they actually work together? Okay. And the simplest example of that is I'll use my own person. So um, I have underlying health conditions. Okay, it doesn't matter what they are, but I have some. And as a consequence for my team to deal with my health issues, they give me multiple therapies. So there's different drugs and different things that they actually give me. Based on where we're at in the landscape at the minute, there's the potential for me to have probably five different apps, one for each of those therapies, that are all completely separate, that all need individual management. I'm reasonably tech savvy. I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I'm reasonably tech savvy. That's a real pain in my backside. Now, we're starting to see a lot of the health authorities and governments kind of go, hey, how do we, yes, have those individual apps? And it's right for them, again, creating that asset value specific to your, um, your tailored solution but how do we make sure that they actually can come together in a synergistic way and look at the whole story? Very few people are going to have single therapies. The majority of folks out there now and going forwards will have a multi-therapy journey. And as a consequence, they will not engage in multiple apps all the time. If we as an industry don't do it, we're going to see others come in and, and do it for us. And, and again, some of that has some merits and we can get into that debate at, at another show, but not this particular one. We'll get the likes of uh, an Apple or a Google that will come in and build their health app and, and they'll basically just be the app for everything. And, you know, and, and, and they'll take um, dominance and control and stuff over it. So the one thing I would implore everybody here is, is think about those few pieces, but especially that last one is, 
yes, you want to be unique. Yes, you want to be standalone in terms of your application and, and obviously drive value for you, your shareholders, and obviously the folks that you're serving. But how do you actually work with everybody else within the industry? And on that thought, back to you, Connor. That was wonderful, Larry. Some really great insights there. So we're going to open up to the floor for uh, your questions. So if, if people have questions, maybe use the hand and we'll go. Um, if you can raise the hand uh, in Zoom, we'll go through and we'll um, ask you uh, to talk a little bit more. So any questions from the audience now? Um, I might just um, kick the ball off and start the ball rolling. Um, just to, a bit of a question for both Thomas and Larry. Both of your companies have been involved in um, health uh, apps for healthcare, but also other areas. Uh, and would you draw like, I know Larry, you were saying that um, healthcare apps, they don't need to be as um, slow as some people might imagine. But um, would you draw a distinction between apps for healthcare and, and for other areas in terms of the, the time taken to bring it to market or um, the amount of regulatory overhead involved? Uh, yeah, absolutely, it, it, it is. So um, if we're bringing, so again, we're, we're lucky from an airphone point of view is we'll work across all industries. So financial, health, uh, retail, gaming, you know, wherever, it doesn't particularly matter. Um, if we're bringing a, uh, a retail app, let's say to market, if we're or a solution, if we get it slightly wrong, okay, the, uh, you know, the consequences is probably a hit on some profit margin. There might be some stock wasted. There might be a dissatisfied customer too. It's not great and, and fortunate in their form. Thankfully, we're, we're pretty good at what we do and, and, and therefore we mitigate a lot of that kind of risk. But the consequences of getting stuff to market and, and it not being where it needs to be are not huge. When we look at financial services, when we look and particularly at health, is if we get it wrong, it has a more significant impact. And therefore, we have to make sure that, you know, the regulations that Thomas talked about, you, they're there for a reason. So, you know, you get folks going, oh, my God, they're barrier to entry. They're stopping us actually getting forward. They're there for a very good reason. And, and you know, yeah, we need to challenge those, those regulations to make sure that they are fit for purpose and they do meet with today's uh, needs. But fundamentally, they're there because the, the solutions that everybody on this call are looking at bringing to market are going to have a very material real world impact in terms of people's uh, healthcare journeys and, and pathways. So it is important that we take our time, we do it right. But that doesn't mean we have to slow right down. We can still be extremely agile, extremely nimble and fast. And, and again, COVID demonstrated that, we, you know, the COVID app and the impact of the COVID app and getting it right was of paramount importance. Oh, sorry. Uh, of paramount importance. And from that point of view, you know, we moved extremely, extremely quickly. You know, we had, what was it, 1.3 million folks on it within, literally within hours of us actually launching it. And it's gone on to be one of the most successful apps that are, that are actually out there across the globe in, in terms of, of COVID response, with millions of folks benefiting from it. And it obviously, you know, having a real terms impact in terms of the spread of COVID. So you have to get those kind of things right. And having oopsie moments within healthcare really have to be avoided at all costs. Thomas? Yeah, no, I'm really well said, Larry. Um, it's it, it, it's definitely like it's really important to be the biggest difference we notice is it is about the kind of like design execution. So getting involved from key stakeholders from the beginnings so that they all feel included because you don't get many opportunities to, uh, you know, if something impedes in a care pathway, it, you know, it's going to be uh, identified very swiftly. And if you're, if you're a root cause of that, you know, it's not a good impact in terms of buying. And unfortunately, what's happened to healthcare services uh, in the past is that they might have been burned from maybe former vendors or solutions before, and it's just a bit more risk averse. Um, so it's really being cognizant of, of that. Um, and also as well, like I, I immediately kind of mentioned the regulatory thing uh, a bit, but going back to regulatory, it's even just good to even just look at it, just see where you one sits. So if you're not classified, you don't need to be classified as a medical device, you've got the confidence to say that, and you can have the confidence to say to your stakeholders, be it investors, this is what this is where we're at, and this is why we're positioned this way, and 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 and, and that's that, that and, and you can proceed with that. Then. But I think Thomas, that's a really good point from that point of view. Is 
absolutely make sure if you have to certify, you know it. If you don't, if yeah. you're exempt from it perfectly. But even if you do have to certify, look at where that certification is needed on your, your product journey, on your company journey. Exactly. And it's not necessarily the first thing you got to do, you know, prove the concept, yeah. get some stuff going before you actually get it. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of, again, it's, 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 it's going, it's seeing as part of your product roadmap what, where it sits, but maybe it might sit a little bit earlier if you, if you need to. And also there's actually ways, there's a gray area too, where you can break your components into units. So certain parts could be maybe classified at a higher classification or design. So there's an art to it and a, a, a good registry consultant would be a huge help. And, and Larry mentioned a really good point as well in terms of just collaboration. There's lots of companies like Nearform, you know, Rockstars now in the digital health space really brought uh, digital health from the niche to the mainstream. Uh, you know, companies like Zendra Health and others in Ireland, you know, Ireland's a brilliant space in med tech and digital health. So there's lots of companies out there that have been there, been through what you're probably going through at the moment. I would more more than happy to share that advice. Yeah, that's really great advice there, Thomas. So um, we have a couple of questions coming in in the chat, and some some of them um, quite technical. So uh, um, a question from Brian Cleary, and Brian, feel free to um, open your mic if you'd like to ask it in person. Like that. And so Brian's asking, how do you see smart on FHIR changing healthcare? In the next five years, so um, um, I, I think I, I think to, to be honest, it, I, I think it'll be a, a, it, it might be a game changer such, but I think it could be a game changer and whether uh, you, you might be accepted as a vendor for within a healthcare uh, provider. Um, so, say for example, NHS or the HSC um, or whoever you're looking to go for, seeing like are, are they looking to embrace these technologies, healthcare standards, the standardizing of clinical terms. Um, and if they are, then definitely embrace that because that would be a checklist that you have that other competitors don't have. So it's more of a kind of like, a, it's, it's more of an entry into a market and making sure you have your ducks in a row that you have that in place. Yeah, it's very good. And just on, on that related theme, Mark um, O'Sullivan was asking, apart from HL7, um, are there other technologies or considerations or challenges to integrating with electronic health records um, from a technical point of view? Um, so I, just one point on the smart as well as, sorry, just the back, is that it will be a, a huge thing in terms of when people start embracing it, the, the amount of information that they'd be able to actually perform analytics on would be a game changer because clinical terms will be associated with uh, the smart, uh, no, sorry, sorry, it's NOMED, sorry, I meant uh, codes. Um, so that will actually really kind of provide really proper insights in terms of uh, kind of integration with partners. The main thing really is that from our experience is that make sure when you're building a solution that number one, um, you're collecting all the, the data points you're capturing are the ones that you want to make sure you have that covered because there's very likely you might have a big data play as part of your commercial strategy uh, or that might be useful going forward, maybe anonymizing that data. So first of all, make sure that you're collecting all the data points that you want for your solution. That might be useful for you, your key stakeholders, or maybe to commercialize going forward. And then, secondly, is um, is is to do with uh, that as long as you store in open healthcare standards, and that could fire H L seven fire could be one of them. Um, that that it, that opens the door to electronic health record records because the big players have realised they need the 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 age of being monolith is over. They need to be interoperable, and they all have. They all have HL7 fire APIs. Very good. Thanks for that, Thomas. Um, I've, we have a question coming in for Larry, and it's um, from Aoife from International Pelvic Physiotherapy Management Limited. And Aoife is, is asking for tips about transitioning from selling digital prod products on a website and e-learning platform, um, which she's doing at the moment, um, to an app. So that's the sort of the question is about transitioning. So if uh, if I understand the question, you're currently you've got products you're selling via website that you now want to sell via an app. Is that yeah? You you can unmic yourself if you want. Actually, you know, if that's not too much. Uh, thanks very much, Larry. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, Larry, that's exactly it. We're currently selling some digital products via our website. Yep. And introduced an e-learning platform which allowed us to sell them in bulk and at scale and now we're thinking of introducing an app because people have asked us for one so yeah. users of the products 
So maybe not necessarily to sell them, but maybe as an add-on feature. And also, Larry, we've a very tight budget, like everybody, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I guess from, from that point of view is uh, understanding the underlying technologies and how you're actually going to, to drive forward. So if you go back, you know, I remember uh, a particular company I, I set up, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago, very different technology stack uh, in, in terms of to be able to do the things I wanted to do. It was all about using native technologies and stuff. So like within iOS and Droid and web were basically three completely separate teams doing three completely separate things and, and, and disciplines. And they all had their individual limitations. And there was always going to be a variance between them. If you look at some of the newer stacks so from a, a near form point of view, for example, and, and there's other flavors and, and varieties and stuff out there, you know, we'll typically use something like React Native. So from a React Native point of view is we can build and design and obviously create um, such that we can obviously go across multiple platforms. So um, depending on the complexity, and, and one of the drawbacks we used to have, so again, go back to 10 years ago, you, you had some of those cross-platform type things that are out there, phone gaps and, 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 and a bunch of others. They were limited and, and you were constrained in terms of what you can do. The way things have evolved and, and, and they'll continue to evolve, and as I say, there's a bunch of them now that are out there, is you can end up creating effectively a single code base so from a cost point of view is, sure, there's an upfront cost of investing to actually get that done, but then your ongoing uh, maintenance and support and, and your longer term operational costs are obviously brought down. It also means you can move a lot faster. So it's not about having different teams on different places to actually do it all. It's, you know, one team, make your changes, commit them across all different platforms and make sure they actually get out there is point one. Uh, the second piece is, is is really spend time ahead of doing anything, especially if you've got a, a limited budget, is is really understand what is it, you know, what are the objectives? What are you actually trying to achieve? What's the benefit that you're actually going to create for your business and for your target audience? Um, and very much narrow in on that. So get your design and planning stage right first, rather than go, oh, this sounds like a great idea and let's start on a journey. And and using Agile, which is great, but then you Agile all over the show uh, and it ends up obviously disrupting your kind of budget. So get yourself in that kind of zone, very clearly mapped out. What is it you're trying to achieve? Where are you looking to get to? Yes, once you start the process, if you've got a good team around you or, or consultants working with you, they will take an Agile approach because it evolves as you actually work your way through it, but at least have some nice solid guide rails so you know what you're actually doing and are you really going to get the return on investment that you actually want to look at? Um, and uh, thanks, Larry. And I just uh, just to add to that as well, um, Eva. Um, because an app, it's kind of like it's in people's pocket. It's, it's even more personalised. Uh, consider as well, um, you know, as you transition it or you look at the transition from a website to an app, um, is is it going to be just a website equivalent on the app, or are you looking to kind of tap into to make it a bit more interventional? You know, a bit more kind of like giving them nudges at the right time you know that aligns with their kind of learning e-learning program so have a think about that in terms of a kind of because there's obviously uh, there's pros and cons of websites and apps but the apps there's ways you can tap into engagement and get people get their attention at the right place at the right time um and so yeah, i have a think about that and and, 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 and really think of like what, what the courts are targeting um what really are the benefits of having on the app versus the website where, where can you actually get better engagement from and, and, and go from there? Thanks very much, Thomas. That's a huge help. Thank you, Larry, as well. Excellent. No Pleasure. Thank you very much for your question, Eva. That was very nice. Um, very good question. So do we have any more questions? I saw a few hands going up there. Um, do we have any questions from the, the audience there? I'm seeing one there from Martin Lawler. Um, so uh, th thanks, Martin. Um, you just ask an opinion on potential investor views and increase the level of regulation. Um, so like the last thing one we do here is going to registry do, going to, uh, do merchant here. Um, all I'd recommend, Martin, in your case is that, um, and if, if you're in your early, the early one does this in a journey, because you're at your crossroads and you're seeing, okay, are we, you know, wellness solution communications or are we on the registry pathway? And we might need to be classified as another device. What I just recommend you have a conversation uh, read up on it based on the market you're going to, so based on the registry body. So, you know, as I said, in Ireland, HBRA, England, UK, uh, MHRA, etc., FDA in the US. Um, and engage with registry consultants. So I'm happy to send some recommendations. They give you guidance, and be it now or in the future where you sit. 
And, and from that, you have confidence then going, yes, Mr. Investor, investors, uh, Mr. Investors, uh, is, is that um, we, did, we did due diligence, we engaged with a registry consultant, um, we approached the registry body as well, or we, we, and we were quite confident it is not a medical device, or it is, and this is the classification. Uh, and that will, that will just uh, appease any of those kind of right questions that follow. Martin, on a slightly different, um, uh, I, and uh, you can tell I'm more on the sort of, uh, you know, building business side of it. I see regulations kind of double-edged sword. So you see regulation, you go, oh my God, there's all mm -hmm. these different pieces. Now, there is a good side to it, and I think Thomas will, will probably do it. There's a greater move for the industry to actually start challenging some of those regulations where before it was just spoon fed tea and you had to take it and just get on with it. There's now more of a growing dialogue. We've still got a long journey to go, but there's a growing dialogue that actually sits behind it. And we're also seeing a bigger desire for um, more common standards, even though they're different necessarily regional regulations. But there is a lot more of that kind of collaboration that people are, you know, talking. So, you know, Europe, you know, EMA and FDA are not, you know, worlds and worlds apart on everything. Now, again, there's still a big journey to go to actually bring them together. So in terms of the landscape of that side of it, it is improving. Uh, as Thomas rightly pointed out, as long as you've done your due diligence, you know where you're set up, you know what you're, how you're going to tackle those challenges. Um, I think investors are, are expecting to see that, and that's part of your funding ask or your investment ask if you're an investor. The second side of that sword, however, is it does create barrier to market. Now, barrier to market for startup is obviously a challenge, but it's also an advantage because uh, that challenge is facing other folks. So if you can get ahead of that barrier and get yourself out there, it means that once you've created yourself up there, the speed of somebody else to come up and start snapping at your heels is obviously that little bit slower. And from my point of view as an investor, I'm looking at that because Martin, you come to me with a great project and, and, and a great product idea. It's like wonderful, fabulous. How do we actually protect that, um, that, that offering long enough to get so far ahead of the posse that we're, we're obviously the market leader? Because I always want you know, my businesses to end up in one, two, three spot in a, in, a, in a saturated market. The best way to do that is to get that head start and, and regulation, as long as you've done what Thomas said, really worked your way through it, know what you got to do and your steps to get through it. If you can get through there faster with a good product, it will give you then that little bit of, of, of uh, headspace to actually get out ahead of the rest of the posse before people play catch up with it. Yeah, it's a very good point, Larry. It's, it's a defensibility. Um, so um, it may be to kind of re reproduce your solution uh, you know, mightn't be as much effort for a competitor, but if you actually did that and you say you did it according to medicalized register standards because it, it, it was the best option for you commercially, um, that's that's a lot harder for someone else to actually play catch up on. Um, and also, um, from 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 prospects and from potential clients, it, it it is another kind of value add. It's like okay, these guys, they, you know, they, they're actually putting patient safety and risk management, you know, at the very forefront of the software development life cycle. And they've, they've proven that through to, uh, as well, through the, the medical device history echoes that they have with their solution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Martin. That was a great question there. And so we have a question from Gordon now. So Gordon, would you like to ask your question yourself or I can read through it? If yeah. You uh, hi guys. Um, thanks for today. It's been very, very beneficial. So we are a meditation app and we're moving from in-app purchasing to a subscription model next month. Um, and I'm just kind of wary because we've been doing the in-app purchasing for two years, um, but it seems that the subscription is a better model to follow. Um, anything we should look out for once we move to that new model? Anything that we should be cautious of, do you think? Yeah, I guess uh, subscription model is absolutely a great way to go forward. Super to underpin your business. Um, obviously, you need to make it as frictionless as you possibly can is to get people on board and, and, and kind of get them in there. Um, and getting them in there obviously is, is a big part of the actual journey. But again, that that uh, subscription retention, so keeping people there longer term and obviously making sure that they don't drop out or they don't you know um, fall away from wayside is making sure that, again, everything needs to work. You have to be very careful. When you're doing in-app purchases and, and have worked in a couple of different businesses where in-app purchases, it's a point in time event. So yeah. you have to be good at that point in time. When you're on subscriptions, it's every point in time. And the problem okay. is, is if you have a bad uh, experience at any point with a subscription journey, 
there's a risk that you're going to see fall off and, and therefore your subscription model starts to sort of creak a little bit. So um, they're kind of the big differences in, in terms of understanding the engineering capability and all the rest of it. So again, you need to just make sure that you're more consistent, you know, when you're coming to market, when you're going through your updates and all the rest of it, you can't afford to have those little blips that you can in the, you know, um, the in-app purchase piece. Because in the in-app yeah. purchase piece, you can have a blip, you know, you can have some leverage of, of downtime for, I don't know, a few minutes or, or 30 minutes, whatever else. All you're jeopardizing is, is really that in-app purchase at, during that window. And, and not everybody, you'll be unfortunate if your whole um, uh, entire base was obviously focused on that. Within the subscription side of it, it's a little bit more fragile. So all that energy you've gone in from a frictionless point of view, getting them on board, you need to make sure they have that consistency. So just be a little bit more careful in terms of your release cycles. Make sure you're undenying engineering and scalability is obviously there to have it. So you're not going to start bumping up against limits. That's brilliant. And, Thank you. I didn't even yeah. think of that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and assaults as well, just instrumentation. So um, just like making sure that interactions, because now you're, you're kind of like, you're getting your revenue more in a regular subscription based model, just being really cognizant of what parts of the solution that you can kind of customers like, what they don't, and, 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 and keep on top of that, the product. And um, also maybe as well, just you probably do a really good job anyway, but really kind of just, customer success management, you know, like, you know, just uh, because now, you, you know, it's, as part of, it's a kind of ongoing relationship that you're having now, it's rather than something maybe like once, like a once off, it's making sure that, again, you're probably already delivering next and service, but really kind of be, being aware of that and, and looking to maybe improve that if, if there's areas to, to tweak. Yeah, we have a weakness there as well. So we're, we're working on that at the moment. So that's something we're trying to strengthen. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Right. Thank you. That's an excellent question there, Gordon. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got a question here from AD Stack about um, getting more information on accessibility. Um, AD, would you like to ask your question? Or yeah, hi. Um, we are, I'm interested in finding out more about how, um, let's say, where we can get more information on accessibility and um, who you think has developed that really well. Um, most of healthcare records is often to make sure that gaps in communication are avoided. So I suppose accessibility in, in any, the, any way that we can make the information more, more usable, but also more accessible is key to having a successful outcome with our product. Sure, I guess from a, a you know, um, an engagement accessibility, you know, uh, designing point of view, uh, there's a there's a number of firms and, and folks that are out there. So again, the, the, there's a plethora of offerings out there. Um, in particular, I like NCBI and, and we do a lot of work with NCBI and stuff. Um, so, so they support a lot of the things that we actually do in terms of training, understanding, certifications, um, and just advising on it. So it's making sure that all of the team understand all of those accessibility options um, and, and what they actually need to think through. And then once we're ready to actually go out with a, you know, um, a launch or whatever else ahead of that, as we'll quite often use them, especially with some of the work we're doing in, in government health spaces, we'll get them to take it through a full accessibility test. And then at each release cycle, we'll get them to renew that to make sure that we're, we're leveraging every tool within our toolbox to make sure it is fully accessible. So, so let's say eyesight is one, but is there an accessibility? So for example, for people who have poor hearing, for let's say neurodiverse, uh, that would be an area where a lot of our patients um, would uh, com would be generally poor communicators. So yeah. to see, is there more than eyesight, which in one way now on most phones is avoidable because you can have it that it speaks to you. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, a suite of, of one of the, in one way, the eyesight is almost most fixable. And um, that is there, when we think of true accessibility, is there an, a resource for where um, making the program where people can access um, guidance on how to make the product more accessible? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and from that point of view, uh, again, we, we use multiple different folks depending on what speciality we're actually getting into. Uh, as an overarching, NCBI are not just looking at it from a you know, visually impaired point of view. They are looking at that over, overall accessibility journey uh, and understanding folks that have cognitive impairments, obviously vision issues, hearing, et cetera. So again, it's, it's kind of dealing with that whole piece. Uh, we've also done some work with, you know, um, Care of the Aged and a few of those organizations to more look at just from a demographic point of view, 
getting away from clinical accessibility kind of issues and just understanding user behavior. So finding a blend of the right folks. Um, but my starter point for you uh, would be, I'd, if I was you, I'd reach out to uh, NCBI and have a conversation with Sean or Kieran and, and, and see what they say. Uh, and, and just to add to that as well, so that, uh, very well answered, Larry, um, is, uh, you know, there's there's guidelines there as well. Um, so like, uh, wouldn't be as uh, specific as the kind of cohorts you're looking for, but like the app and human interface uh, guidelines. And um, there's also the standard um, uh, IEC 62366 usability engineering as well, it's kind of technical. And I'll be honest, like, yeah, a chat with the NCBI, uh, you know, or a kind of like an interface in between that expertise, like a UX engineer consultant, um, that has experience as well in designing solutions, I think that'd be a really good touch point. So like if, if you could actually engage with someone that has prior experience with that, um, they'd be easy, be able to easily kind of give that information in a, in a nice, very palatable, palatable manner. Yeah, we have a lot of people with in communities to know, are we missing things? Because most of it's based on user feedback at the moment mm -hmm. and what they like, but it's to know what are we missing? So yeah, no, absolutely. We can get in touch with NCBI. I, I think to be honest, like, the fact that you're actually getting you know involved, you know that feedback from key stakeholders, that's brilliant. You know, so um, yeah, so I think just the, the more feedback you're getting, the better as part of that process. So well done. Feel feel free to reach out to me. I'll introduce you to Sean and the guys over at NCBI. Great. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. Brilliant. Thanks for that question, Aidan. That's great. Um, we've got another um, question from Mark O'Sullivan about um, GS1 standards. So I think uh, Mark was. Um, offering to help people with um, scanning GS1 barcodes correctly. Uh, Mark, would you like to ask a question? Or uh, I think that was Siobhan responding to Mark's question about standards, is it? Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. that was, was Siobhan. Sorry about that. Um, thanks okay. for that, Siobhan. Thanks for that response. Um, yeah, I think Siobhan is offering to help everybody with GS1, so everybody just flood her with requests. Okay, yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> That's yeah, brilliant. But, yeah. But, but sorry, I, I feel like I've hijacked Mark's question, so maybe Mark wants to ask the question, because I'm, I'm sure there's other answers as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for that, Siobhan. Um, so I think we had a hands up there from Brendan Casey, who is our sister organisation at DKIT. Um, but I think you might have to have. Yeah, I'm back up here, Connor. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back up. Brilliant. That's great. I can yes. hear you now. Thanks, Brenda. Larry and Thomas. Uh, great session, Connor. Uh, I'm just going back to one of Larry's points around um, open source um, and developing still. And I suppose I've been looking at a little bit, and obviously it feeds into the whole conversation around collaboration. And I'm just wondering are there any good examples in Ireland? Uh, I was looking at Estonia and what they've done over there. And I suppose a lot of it has led from the Department of Health and you know the bigger system. But how do you see opportunities, I suppose, for startups and scaling, scaling companies uh, within open source technology um, in healthcare? I've just seen if, if there's anything happening, what, what's happening, I suppose, and how you see it progressing in Ireland in the coming years. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So um, in, in terms of it progressing, and, and obviously there's a whole bunch of open source tools and options that are out there and available for folks today. Just go out and help yourselves. Uh, again, reach out and, and, and leverage them. Uh, from a government and an Irish healthcare point of view, the you know the wider government itself are very keen to push hard. And obviously uh, what we did with COVID-19 <clears throat> And the COVID Green app, you know, that was a, a clear example and, and uh, a, a very definitive thing at a time of need where we took all of the work that we did from that point of view and, and open sourced it. Uh, you know, there's conversations ongoing at government level about open EHR and open EHR standards. Uh, we're looking at some of the, uh, you know, some of the other areas and some of the other projects that we'll work on with them over the next, you know, year or two uh, with the view to... Now, be careful, and I will caveat this for everybody, is let me be super clear. Nearform are not a product company insofar as we don't build products for Nearform. So we're, we're never looking to, so the, like the COVID app is not a Nearform-owned product. We build these things on other people's behalf. So uh, we're in a fortunate position as we can be that kind of honest broker, mediator person in the room. We don't have a vested interest in any particular flavor. We're, we're quite agnostic. Um, but fundamentally, uh, what I would say to folks is, is understand 
if your product does lend itself to a long-term open source journey and, and how that creates value for user business. And it is a very different business proposition um, than has been historically. And again, as I said before, anybody wants to reach out and have a, a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation with it, just ping me and, and we, we can set that up. Um, but the government itself, not just here, uh, I was over in Edinburgh with the Scottish government last week, talking to a few other governments over the last you know, few months. Everybody is very much focused on understanding the projects that they're delivering is how can they actually benefit from leveraging open source and also contributing back into the community things that are actually going forwards. So it is a growing narrative. Don't get me wrong, we've still got the mainstays in there. So you've still got the Accentures, the Microsofts, you know, uh, the Salesforces and all those kind of guys with big pri proprietary things that are not open source and, and that they're looking to drive forwards. But even those organizations are starting to come on board and, and we're seeing that growing community around how do we actually Again, remember the three layers I spoke about, protected assets, keep those where they are, and that's where you want to look at your intrinsic value. And then, you know, how do we leverage common components and open source components and share that kind of, whether in an open source fashion or whether just in a collaborative fashion, how do we use that to sort of get everybody moving along faster and, and raise all boats and, and then let you, you guys focus on your true asset value that's out there. But again, happy to have a conversation with anybody individually if they want to reach out. Yes, that's a very good uh, kind of overview of the open source um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, I guess like just how exactly to draw a line between what is the crown jewels of a company that they don't want to make open source. So for example, with the, um, I noticed that the, the entire COVID tracking app was, was made open source. Mm -hmm. And like, um, would there be any concerns that integrated in that there is something that is kind of core to the company that would be um, reducing uh, value or the cost to the company? Um, so again, it's 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 probably a whole another webinar in its, in its own right, to, to, be, to be fair. Um, distinguishing, was, there's a very easy, if we talk about those layers, they're relatively easy to distinguish. You know, the asset value, the protected piece that are either going to give competitive advantage or the things that you can actually uh, create shareholder value directly around. So, so just as a very loose term that sits underneath uh, and it's unique to you as you as a business. So, so, so that's where you want to focus your asset value creation. Uh, if you look at the layers that sit underneath either the common, whether it's in open source or outside of open source, these are things that everybody's going to need to do. So everybody needs to kind of have it. It makes sense that, and it doesn't give you any real competitive advantage out there, but your value creation is dependent upon it. So why not work collectively to actually drive it forwards? Um, you know, it creates that kind of advantage within the, the um, uh, within the, 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 you know, the wider work is if you've got a whole bunch of folks creating a community around building X, then obviously your costs are dispersed across that you're not having to carry that whole can. And, and it's one of the, you know, big conversations we're having at government level is, you know, uh, if you need a new app A, well, Ireland, you need it. Scotland, you need it. New York, you need it. Well, why are you each going to pay Nearform to come in and build one of these and pay individually? Why don't we just build it slightly different? Again, it's similar, but slightly different so we can scale it more and therefore reduce the cost significantly for everybody and just share it. You know, that kind of makes a huge amount of sense in my very simple uh, mind and, and people kind of go yeah that does actually make sense now it's not always that easy there are politics and there are rules and there are regulations as Thomas kind of referred to in this so we have to navigate a few of those it's not always kind of straightforward the second piece and going back to the asset value and how you define that asset value now that's a bigger question in terms of what is your value proposition going out to market and where are you looking to get your returns from so you know there are companies out there that are building software purely with the intent of putting it straight out into an open source and making it freely available but then they're able to give shareholder returns and build their value proposition in terms of support services that actually go around it rather than in the thing itself. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of looking at, at those kind of different models and, and they, again, can get, be as simple and as complex as you actually want. So bigger, wider conversation, we probably don't have time for that today, especially when poor Sean has been sitting there with his hand up for the last 15 minutes waiting for us to fall on him. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good, a great answer there. You have very comprehensive clarity. Thanks for that. Sure. Um, Sean, would you like to ask your question there? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I work in the ambulance service and I suppose my I, I've an idea I've been toying with for a while and it's based around cardiac arrest mm -hmm. and the, the development of an app. But I think to make the, the app a bit 
more user friendly. It's about adding a kind of a voice activation or recognition aspect to it. And I'm just wondering how, I suppose, how hard or how time frame does it take to develop an app that will recognize uh, a voice so that you can give it prompts or you can give it information and it will timestamp that uh, information. Does yeah, I, I, again, unfortunately, that's um, that's kind of how long is a piece of string kind of question. I don't mean to, to be a little bit. It's more about the devils in the detail. There are existing software libraries and tools and, and services and stuff available that you can leverage to pull upon to underpin what you're trying to achieve within your app. And then you create the logic that actually goes with it. Um, so you, you'd have to do that kind of assessment in terms of looking, understanding what are the commands, what are the circumstances, what are the devices that are actually being used and what are the outcomes you're, you're trying to get yourself through. So th there's a little bit more um, detail to the question than, than is probably right for, for the audience here, but it's not a case of it. And this goes back to my earlier point. Everything you do when you're thinking about an app or thinking about a company or everything else is look at where you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So what components uh, constituent parts can you actually pull from whether it is open source whether it's partnerships whether it's it's whatever else what can you actually pull out and, and actually leverage and, and there's a huge amount of tools out there uh, apple google provide a whole bunch of them and then there's a, a, a suite of libraries from across github that you can actually pull and leverage those and and your idea is more about pulling those common components together, building then your unique piece on it, and then creating that bundled offering that you're actually putting out to market just as a, as, a, as a very high level sort of overview of what it is you probably need to do. Okay, cheers, thank you. Sure. That's very good, Larry. So I think that's an excellent example of a place where leveraging existing open source software will be a very good starting point um, for that project. Then. Uh, but do just one other point, Connor, on that is, is in coming away from the second. Do also, Sean, again, if you're in the very early stages of, of thoughts and ideas and, and all the rest of it, there are a whole bunch of supports out in the marketplace, non-technical. So again, Enterprise Ireland and a whole bunch of others that have funding available for you to do initial sort of concepts, research and, and, and digging into it. So do you know leverage those as much as you can one from a financial point of view there's there's a few bob in it so so they'll fund some initial work to actually you know get you off your knees but using the, the local leos and and deconnect and and the academic institutions and stuff they really will help you understand whether you've got a viable proposition in your current thinking or whether you need to modify it or you know uh, is it the right way for you to actually go forwards before you spend a ton of time on it and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Larry. And, and just add to that as well, just make, uh, you know, have sufficient uh, engagement with the stakeholders as well. So people that you think will be using this app solution, Sean, think like, you know, what medium they think that'd be beneficial, would what voice activation generally be of benefit? And as I said, the, the rest then is just a matter of detail in terms of, yeah, there's, this is plentiful of open source software out there that you can be able to leverage what you're looking to do, but it's making sure that it, it fits the right need, it's, it fits the right needs that the, the target audience should be looking to go after. Okay, thank you. I suppose you have the survival rate from cardiac arrest in Cork having been measured as like at 7%, mm. and it's a dynamic environment, mm. and you have a scenario where uh, like it's all hands on. So I suppose that's where the voice activation kind of um, aspect of it will come into its own to improve the outcomes and to um, yeah. just improve the overall teamwork, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Thanks very much for your question, Sean. That was great. And um, we have another question from Aoife now just about investors that are active in the space of app development. Um, Aoife, would you like to ask your question uh, yourself there? Yes, uh, good morning again. Thank you very much, Connor. Could I just ask the panel and anybody else here if they would be aware of any investors that had a particular interest in companies that are providing um, healthcare via apps? And I suppose, Larry, I was interested in your point there, you know, from a cost saving, you know, if countries could get together that are interested in providing these services that people need globally. I suppose I was thinking about that, that that's a good idea. And again, in combining our expertise and our, you know, but, but if there were, um, I know there are the Enterprise Ireland's and 
but are there particular investors? Do you know of any um, that might be interested in uh, coming on board with a company like ourselves? Sure. Uh, so again, in, in, in terms of uh, talking specifically about your company, obviously I'm not familiar with your company, so my apologies on that. So I can't make any specific recommendations on, on that side of it. In terms of within the health market, yeah, absolutely. There is a plethora of folks out there with uh, pockets full of cash that they're, they're looking to invest and invest wisely. So it is out there, but like with any investment, it's making sure that you find the right partner that can support your business you know and again bringing to them is that value proposition so what is it they're actually going to do so from an investor point of view whether it's you know public or private sector doesn't really matter is they're trying to understand what's the outcome they're going to get from it so what does your product do what does your service is it scalable um what can you achieve out there in terms of the whole uh, health market there's a huge amount of of uh, investment activity going on there you know at the moment huge amount of, of mergers and acquisitions so it's it's a very hot market so it won't be a problem getting into conversations with a, a, a wide range of, of folks uh, and there are certain um, organizations and houses that are specifically focusing just on healthcare investments and whatnot and, and again it's just finding the right blend of, of the right match between companies and, and yourselves. In terms of Enterprise Ireland, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're you know, obviously they take positions and, and provide funding and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in terms of that government interactions that we kind of talked about, there's a lot of activity going on that side. That doesn't, that'll be pretty much self-funded within those kind of government organizations themselves. So that side of it is fine, but they're always very keen. And we're seeing a lot more with each regional government is they are looking to uh, support indigenous SMEs and startups. So again, there's the potential to obviously leverage that. Best folks to talk to for that, again, in my opinion, would be uh, Enterprise Ireland, your Leo offices and, and the Leo offices and stuff. They'll they'll really sort of help guide you in, in that way. But but again, use all the all the folks that are around you, people on this call, feel free to reach out. Thomas, you're you're in the midst of all of this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, there's, there's also, um, yeah, so, um, there's, you know, engage with uh, the likes of D-Connect, the Health Innovation Hub Ireland, you know, it's going to kind of broke you to actually maybe you know, put your solution initially when in a healthcare settings, obviously you're in a healthcare setting yourself. Um, yeah, so um, I recommend that as well to take that into consideration. Absolutely, and that's one of the roles of D-Connect is to um, support you in these sort of um, explorations, so exploring the potential of your technology and potential sources of funding around that. So do feel free to reach out and get in touch with us here at DConnect. Um, I've got a question now. Oh, you're on mute, Connor. Don't know why, but you are. Sorry about that. I think it just went on mute. I've got a question there for Thomas. So one of the key um, question um, technology aspects that Zendra emphasizes is having a no-code platform and could you explain a little bit just about what does that mean, a no-code platform, and is the technology mature and, and ready for the development of, um, for example, development of apps? Uh, yeah, so a no-code platform, it just enables people to, to build software without very much with software engineering experience. So if, if like you've seen like ads on YouTube, like Shopify or WordPress, it's creating the equivalent of that to produce software. And what we've done is we've created a no-code platform to allow healthcare services to e easily create digital health apps to enhance their service pathways. And what that kind of helps, and, and you can see like a, Larry near from the wonderful job with COVID Tracker app, it just enables uh, one to kind of like swiftly save one from having to reinvent the wheel. So there's a lot of very common features that are in health solution. And we can just put them into re really easily uh, configurable uh, components such as wearable integration, uh, inf uh, notifications, uh, personalized care plans. And we, they, can, they don't have to worry about those issues that we mentioned, such as cost, maintenance, you know, governance, the regulatory, we handle a, lot, a huge amount of that, um, expertise, um, uh, engineering design. Uh, and they, they don't have to worry about that. And we can just rapidly co create and co design service pathways with the key stakeholders and the client. Thanks for, thanks for that, Thomas. That's a great answer. Um, so there's a question there from Peter. Just, um, I guess he was looking to see um, if there's good resources to start looking at QA regulation things, or would you recommend going through a third-party consultation company um, to do the heavy lifting? So I guess it's kind of 
the trade-off between um, starting then looking at the QA regulation side of things? Um, yeah, so myself, it's, it's or, a good question. Or, yeah, so I, I kind of, um, I'd recommend, so I'm seeing here it's for farmers, maybe you could, you could do it as part of a kind of clinical trial initially to prove the clinical benefits of it. That's one way, so you don't have to, because that's a nice into kind of natural pathway to regulation if it's got clinically backed uh, evidence to prove the efficacy of your solution. So that's one way we don't, have, you can kind of like delay kind of the, any kind of the registry aspects of it, you know, by, by using a pathway to clinical trial. But, you know, going through what we did is uh, we, we were aware we had to embrace, you know, becoming a software as a medical device manufacturer. And um, uh, so what I'd recommend is that it, 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 if, if you kind of think you need to be there now is, is get familiar with the standards. So read up on, you need a strong coffee, like, you know, a litre. But like, uh, it's uh, ISO 1345 and IEC 6304. Developing software and multiple settings. I'll send that information to you. I'm happy to send that offline. So read up about a bit about that so that you're comfortable and you've done a bit of work on what your solution, what if there's competing solutions, how are they positioned? So you might have an idea of, uh, very roughly um, maybe what classification your device might be and if it is classified as a medical device. And then uh, I recommend yes, get, like, reach out to people. Don't do, don't do it yourself. It's much more difficult. So reach out to experts reach out to a registry a consultant to give you guidance on that as well. Yeah, that sounds like excellent advice, Thomas. You need to educate yourself in order to be able to ask the right questions of the consultants. Yeah, 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 rather than kind of going up to them and kind of going, uh, you know, uh, it, you, you're actually just making better use of your time too with a consultant. So just, just try and learn. And there's some there's some courses recommended you go maybe half day day courses just to get, um, you know, for example, the Irish Quality Centre do excellent courses here in Ireland. So it just maybe get you kind of just a, a, a kind of like an introduction into respective standards. Again, I'm happy to send this information to you offline. Excellent. Thanks for that, Thomas. And um, so we have a question from Grace around um, increasing access to universal healthcare. Grace, would you like to ask a question yourself? Thanks. Yeah, thanks to the panel. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, are the panel aware of any examples where um you know you have access to healthcare free at point of care has been coupled with a sustainable business model or um so we i've kind of uh, been involved in we developed a, a, a telemedical system as part of my phd and tested it in the randomized control trial in temple street a number of years back keep circling round and round and then at the step of how do we what's next and how do we move forward but it's that that business bit is uh, jars so it has to be sustainable but are there examples where there's more of a social responsibility framework um, for any kind of tech health companies that, that are doing something really good really high quality um, but are sustainable that you know of sustainable as in a sustainable business model i.e. recurring revenues into the future or sustainable as in environmentally sustainable well, both, and uh, but I, I meant the, the former first. Okay, no problem. Uh, so, so yeah, there are, and again, um, actually, I think on on both points, there's a lot of evolution moving forwards on on that side of it. So, uh, it'd be interested to to again, separate to this, is is understand that journey that you've actually that cycle you keep kind of going through and understanding, you know, why you're stuck on that particular merry-go-round and not able to actually. Um, get people to pay attention and, and actually move forward because there's, there's a bunch of those kind of projects and activities that are actually um, driving forwards <laughs> in terms of that you know telemedicine and and, and uh, providing that point of care and it does actually tie into just and, and why I look for the clarification on the sustainability off the back of COP it's actually been happening before COP but COP has really brought it to the fore sustainability is actually becoming a very key component of a lot of the digital health strategies we're seeing out of governments across the globe so um, they're using it and, and, a, and a piece for everybody here to be, be aware of and, and grace for yourself is um, it is now being considered as one of the scoring factors in return on investment justifications by governments to obviously engage in solutions. So it's not just about patient outcomes, it's not about cost of service and all the rest of it. It is looking at sustainability impact. So grace in terms of telemedicine. Uh, obviously, there's there's a whole cost argument as to why it's you know it's viable and sustainable and all that kind of stuff from a business point of view, but environmentally sustainable, you know, 
if I don't have to get in my car and drive 15 minutes down to the to the um, GP practice to, to actually have a consultation, then obviously there are, you know, sustainability measures and goals um, that we collectively as an industry, I don't mean near form, I mean the wider health industry, are looking at how do we actually capture and measure that and add that back into the whole procurement mindset and thinking, which again requires a lot of rethinking. So um, if you look at the procurement folks, they're used to buying boxes and, and that's, if there's any procurement folks on here, sorry, but yeah, uh, typically they buy boxes. I want a box that's this and that's what they buy. Understanding outcomes-based pricing is, is something that's really evolving within the whole health and life science space. Outcomes is uh, based pricing has been around and has been worked on for quite a number of years, but it's around patient outcomes. We're now also starting to look at what are sustainability outcomes. So how do we, you know, uh, do something in a sustainable way going forwards to help governments achieve the sustainability measures. So on both fronts, it'd be interesting to have a separate conversation. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer there, Larry. Thanks for that. So I think we're about um, running up to the time now that we've planned. So um, I'd like to thank um, Thomas and Larry for their time and their insight into building apps for healthcare. I think it's been an excellent session. I'd like to thank you all for attending as well. And um, again, if that raises any question, any of the questions around um, the next steps for companies, do feel free to reach out to DConnect and we will um, try to connect you with um, information about where to go next, what will be a, a next advisable step for your stage and in your company. Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, bye for now.